from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. What a turnaround in this crude market from 130 last week to 96 this morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York, we begin with the big issue back in a bear market. We've been very, very cautious. It's a completely new regime that we're looking at. You've had substantial market stress. Now we have this conflict on top of that, which is really exacerbating all the issues that were already there. The Fed, the war, the commodity prices, uh, you name it, uh, but that's a pretty tall list. Geopolitical risk coming to the forefront. There is still a lot of uncertainty. It's going to be harder to make gains for risk assets. Uh, unquestionably, it's a trickier environment. It's going to be a tough time, obviously. We're at one of the longest uh, corrections for the NASDAQ, I think, since the global financial crisis. Well, fingers being cut by trying to catch the falling knife. It's sad for me. I don't like being bearish. It has paid to be bearish on the Nasdaq 100. Joining us now is Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab and James Camp of Eagle Asset Management. Kathy, I want to come straight to you. Wow, have we done some work in this market cross asset? I'll get to crude later. In the bond market at the front end from the 140s last week on twos to through 180 in the last couple of days. Kathy, can we push that much further? You know, I doubt it. I think the market's already priced in seven rate hikes by the Fed between now and early next year, end of this year, early next year. So I think, you know, where we are at the short end is pretty much pricing in most of what uh, the market can expect. And, and, and in fact, I think it maybe has gone a little bit too far. But um, in this sort of uncertain environment with the Fed meeting tomorrow or announcement tomorrow, that I'm not surprised the market's pushed it that high. Mike Wilson, two questions. How well understood is the Fed story? How well priced is it now? Yeah, I mean, look, we've pivoted our, you know, fire to ice narrative a bit. You know, it, it's always been about the Fed, uh, you know, moving faster due to the inflation. That's the fire part. But now it's the ice uh, part of the story, which is the slowdown. And obviously this, uh, you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, only exacerbates the growth slowdown. So, you know, it's, I think it's playing out um, pretty much as we expected, except it's just happening faster now because of this event. But that's the thing I think people are still, you know, behind the curve on. I don't think, you know, I don't think it was appreciated coming into this year, as you know, uh, how fast the Fed was going to have to move. And I don't think it was appreciated how much the growth slowdown was going to be there. So now people are catching up and, and getting bearish for, I guess, the right reason, which is, you know, obviously this event is terrible, but not really acknowledging the setup coming into it. Meaning, you know, when you have like the risk of a recession, Right. Recessions happen because the situation is already weakened and then you have a shock that tips you over. And I think that's what the markets are going to try to price in next. That's why, you know, trying to call the bottom here is really not a great idea. Well, Mike, when you think about the equity market at the moment, then is it the earnings and expectations around earnings? We need to pull lower the multiple on them or both? Both. I mean, you're, that's the vice. That's the vice of fire and ice. Right. It's that you have tightening financial conditions into slowing growth. Um, and that's why we were well below you know, the street on our forecast for this year. And as I said before, now this event just makes that even more obvious. But I still don't, like I said, I still don't think the average uh, investor appreciates how weak the setup was prior to this event, which makes this event worse, right? That's the problem. And so, you know, if we get, a, look, we're all praying for a ceasefire and we'd love to see it um, for a lot of reasons. Obviously, you're gonna probably get a massive rally off of that if that were to happen you know, we would be sellers into that because it doesn't change the setup, right? I mean, the setup is the same. And even with a ceasefire or a pause in the conflict, it doesn't, you can't put all this back into the bottle. Like the, the genie's out of the bottle now. So it's just, it makes it, it makes it harder. The first half's going to be rough. Uh, the second half could be better depending on policy choices and how this war, um, you know, kind of resolves itself. Uh, and that's going to be what we have to, that's what we have to monitor to see, you know, when the risk reward gets attractive. But the risk reward is not attractive at 19 times, um, a number that's probably going to have to get cut. Well, let's talk about that number. To what? You said in your research, and I read it yesterday, it was a great read. This line here, this likely means a collision with equity markets this spring with valuations overshooting to the downside. Can you put a number on that, Mike? 
Yeah. So, I mean, as you know, John, um, you know, our longstanding view has been 18 times as fair value. That's how we got to 4,400 for year end back in November. <clears throat> but now, of course, that 18 times, you know, may not be, and that's fair value kind of at the end of the year, assuming things go well, right? But of course, things aren't going well and inflation is out of control and, and, and volatility is out of control. So the equity risk premium, I would argue, and we showed that in our, in our note, is maybe 100 to 150 basis points too low. And if that's right, then you could easily see 16 times, even 15 times on an overshoot um, if that risk premium wants to go to 4, 450, which doesn't seem like a crazy uh, level given what the state of the world. James, is there a reason for the Federal Reserve to back away before they've even started? Our, our take is absolutely not. I mean, this inflation story that we began talking about 14 months ago started with supply chain. Then we had the massive demand pull forward because of stimulus. Uh, we have the highest inflation in 40 years. If the Federal Reserve is true to its word of price stability, they have no choice. And I think the easier choices could have been made last summer. The Fed passed on that. Powell did his pivot uh, after his renomination back in uh, October, November timeframe. And we're looking at a reacceleration of the inflation story because of the conflict. So uh, to uh, to the other guests comment, yeah, the, the two and three year Treasury is already priced in some moves, but the Fed's going to have to be aggressive to reestablish credibility here. And, and let's remember, this is a political issue now. Every every American has seen price inflation at the pump and food stuff. President Biden looked in the camera and said, this is the Federal Reserve's problem. It is the Federal Reserve's problem, and they can, they're going to have to act. And we're in the camp that we think we're going to get five or six hikes in, in 2022. And they're set to act tomorrow. Fives right now through 2%, twos at 180. The Bank of America fund manager survey reads as follows. Russia now the number one tail risk. Equity allocation the lowest since 2020. Growth optimism the lowest since 2008. Kelly lines some big lines in that report this morning. Yeah, very, very bearish, John. But we have to keep in mind, we've already seen $12 trillion erased from global equities in 2022. There is a long list of global benchmarks that are in bear market territory. And the NASDAQ 100, as we know, entered that yesterday, down 21% from its peak on November 19th. That is the first time that has happened since the depth of the pandemic sell-off in March of 2020. And obviously, a lot of that move has really has been driven by inflation, fears around the war in Ukraine making that worse, and the resulting tightening that could follow, meaning rates go higher and some of those higher value uh, companies, those richer multiples, they're going to come under pressure. But this isn't just a tech story. It's really been true across equities, including the S&P 500, which while didn't enter a bear market yesterday, did enter a technical death cross for the first time since March 2020. So basically the 50 day moving average has crossed below that longer term 200 DMA. Historically, though, that's more of a lagging indicator. Usually by the time it appears, the S&P is already down by double digits, which is the case this year with it off more than 12%. And that is the worst Mar uh, January 1st to March 15th period going all the way back in history, the fourth worst time. In the interesting part, though, is that in the other seven times that has happened, five of those years, the equity market actually closed higher. So we have to keep that in mind. And just looking beneath the surface of the index, it hasn't been down for everything, just everything other than energy, at least on a sector level. That is still up 33% on a year-to-date basis, even as we've seen oil coming off 20% in just five days. But for the laggards in this market, all of them are those more tech heavy sectors, tech, communication services, discretionary, all doubt the better part of 20 percent. John, Kelly, are you happy to say that crude's in bear market territory? Would you go there this morning? I think you could go there. Of course, it's pretty brutal this morning, John. Kelly Lights, thank you. Brent crude, 100. We were pushing 140 two Sundays ago. Sunday evening, this oil market opened up stateside and Brent crude was at 139. WTI through 130 this morning. Brent at 100, WTI at 96. Kathy, can I ask someone in the bond market, ask you, what on earth is going on in the land of commodities? Well, I mean, this is pretty classic. When you have shortage, perceived shortage, you, you have to ration that short supply and you have to do it at the front end of the, of the futures curve, right? Uh, and so that's why we got into backwardation because you pull forward that the pricing pulls forward that supply for the near term. But once you've satisfied that, um, it, and then, then you get this huge reversal. And I think that what we're seeing is we saw it actually earlier with wheat. Uh, we've seen it with some of the, the uh, other agricultural commodities. And now it's, uh, it's fallen over into the energy market because the supply is still there. 
And now everybody who had to get their hands on it in the short run and everyone who put on a speculative position because they thought there wasn't going to be any oil forever um, now has to liquidate. So it's a fairly standard kind of commodity market um, performance in a situation like this. I've been through a lot of these. Uh, I think for the bond market, you know, the, the key is, well, where are we going from here, right? Where is the inflation picture going from here? It's still a pretty mixed bag. And I think that's what the, the Fed really has to deal with. They have um, rising inflation and high inflation and rising inflation expectations. Now, they're not super high, but they've, they've broken out of the range that I think the Fed is comfortable with. And so they need to act. But at the same time, you've got tightening financial conditions, slowing economic growth. You've got this sort of unprecedented tightening in global liquidity right now or the potential for it because of the sanctions. And so it's a, it's a real, you know, it's a real mess for them to deal with. I think they try to take a cautious approach, but talk big about fighting inflation. A mess is the right word. Brent at 100, WTR at 96. Mike, Kathy, and James are going to be sticking with us. Let's get you some moves ahead of the open and bow. 20 minutes away. Here's Abby. John, well, it seems that that mess in crude oil and the commodity complex may be helping out stocks because we do have the S&P 500 e-mini futures higher along with the NASDAQ 100 e-mini futures. Those are uh, leading the way. Perhaps a first update in four. Microsoft, not surprisingly, then one of the top stocks up 1.3%. This, of course, as yields are lower, giving some relief to high valuation tech stocks. Plus, Microsoft Microsoft is expanding its healthcare and cloud strategies. United Airlines, the airlines really soaring. This, of course, as oil goes lower, the cost of jet fuel. This airline and American Airlines are not hedged, so this goes directly to the bottom line. Occidental Petroleum, the EMP producer, on the other hand, you can see down sharply, down 5.6%. And then finally, that brutal bear market, that sell off in China tech stocks, it continues. It started with Alibaba, and there you have Alibaba in the pre market down another 4.7%. The CSI 300 over in China, and Abby, thank you for the close today down by 4.6 percent the Hang Seng down by almost six percentage points negative 5.72 percent at the close coming up on this program Europe looking to impose fresh sanctions on Putin you will have new ban on some exportation like the luxury goods and we will withdraw to the Russian state the most favored nation clause within the World Trade Organization the latest on Russia and Ukraine next on uh, the new uh, package of sanctions that will be adopted this morning. That's the strongest package of sanctions ever adopted by the European Union in its history. We will have more than 600 Russian people being targeted by those sanctions. The European Union preparing to deliver a fresh round of sanctions on Russia, this coming as the prime ministers of Eastern European nations travel to Kyiv to meet with Ukraine's President Zelensky. The Czech Premier writing on Facebook the following. The purpose of the visit is to confirm the unequivocal support of the entire EU for the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Anne Marie down in DC and Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Maria, just set the scene for us. European leaders heading into a war zone. Yeah, and it's incredible, Jonathan. I mean, this is in every manual of what not to do with an active head of state. We know that the Polish uh, prime minister, the Slovenian prime minister, and the Czech Republic uh, prime minister are now on their way to Kiev. A lot of the details in terms of how they got here are still very secret. We really obviously don't know, and the reason for it is security reasons. This is a Ukrainian capital which is encircled by Russian troops. Now, the goal of this meeting, of course, is to send, according to an officer from the Polish prime minister, uh, office a very strong political message that the European Union is standing behind Ukraine. But I would note a lot of this was done by the Eastern Europeans themselves. So they're going there almost on personal capacity. And remember, Jonathan, we've talked about the different sensitivities across uh, Europe, where you speak to the Western European countries, they do feel threatened by Russia. They do say we do not trust Vladimir Putin and a diplomatic solution out of this is going to be very difficult. Now, on the flip side is still the German Chancellor and the French President Emmanuel Macron, who's 
has been on the phone pretty much daily with Vladimir Putin. They still say they can get to a ceasefire and a diplomatic solution if the two sides agree on basic terms. Now, the problem, of course, is that we've seen that for the Russians and the Ukrainians, the definition of a ceasefire at times is very different. The situation in China, I think, is fascinating here. AMH, if you look at the move in Chinese equities, you can talk about regulation from last year, the hangover into this year. You can talk about lockdowns. But then you can talk about the relationship with Russia, too, and what this could mean for the Chinese economy. AMH, there was a seven-hour meeting yesterday between Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and his Chinese counterpart, the top diplomat. And we have very little, very little explanation as to what actually happened in that meeting. What's the readout? What's the read-through? So on the Jake Sullivan side, we learned that it was substantial, a substantive conversation. And then from Beijing, they called it constructive as they met. But Jonathan, as you mentioned, seven hours, very little details, very uh, slim on exactly the specifics that was discussed in this meeting in Rome between the two. But obviously, this comes as the United States, which we have learned in our reporting, first reported by the Financial Times, has sent cables to the European allies saying that Russia was asking China for military drones. On top of that, you also have the United States wanting to make sure, not that if they don't come to the rescue of President Putin, not just militarily, but make sure they abide by the sanctions regimes. And I think you have a very explicit comment this morning from Foreign Minister of China, Wang Yi, saying that they want to make sure that they maintain uh, their own sovereignty, their own rights as a Chinese country, that they are gone, not going to be impacted for these sanctions. And that raises the question, Jonathan, of what would happen to China if they were to help Russia skirt some of these sanctions. And Marie, and Maria, that issue right there is massive. And on that request to the Chinese for military assistance, the Chinese denied it, one. And then the FT reported yesterday, the FT reported yesterday that the Chinese were open to it. To the both of you, thank you very much. This line from Mike Wilson just jumped off the screen, off the page to me yesterday. Mike, I want to go through it with you. Finally, recessions occur with the arrival of an exogenous shock when the consumer is already in a weakened state. Now, Mike, you know that's where you'll get the pushback. People will be sitting there saying, already, a weaker consumer. Where's that come from, Mike? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, John, we, we, uh, we have no problem embarrassing ourselves and sticking our neck out. But, I mean, like, that's been our view for a while. Um, and, our, you know, prior to this event, um, we felt like the consumer was going to have trouble in the first half of this year for some reasons that I think people have been overlooking. The first one being the government transfers obviously ended in January uh, in a lot of different areas. Number two, inflation now is really eating into uh, discretionary uh, spending. I mean, it's like it's just, you know, people have to spend money on gas and food and other items that are necessities. So that limits their ability to spend on discretionary items. And then we have this payback in demand where even if I have the money and I have the, the, the you know, I, the ability to buy stuff, who needs another durable good? I mean, like we, we did all that already, right? So, and then of course now with this, pan, uh, with this invasion, you know, things like travel, leisure, that may go on the back burner. So services was gonna be the big offset this year. And that was our view that, you know, consumer wallet share would go from goods to services, um, but that now looks questionable given the price of some of those services and also given just now more apprehension about the state of the world uh, and, the, and, the, and the impact on consumer confidence. Now, I've published this stuff for a while, and you've seen it, John, you read our research. I mean, like consumer confidence is already in recessionary levels. That was prior to the invasion. So yep. you know, I don't really understand why there, people aren't talking about that more. They're somewhat dismissive of it because the labor market's been strong. But that's just, that's just where we are. I mean, the consumer is not feeling great about the state of the world. You saw it in the data from University of Michigan. James Camp, your reaction? I think confidence is definitely rolling over, and this, but we have to remember the savings rates, the inertia of a lot of these government transfers is sort of still in the system, and we can sort of parse savings rates by income and, and wealth quartiles, and we do see that it is highly skewed towards the higher incomes. I still think there's some momentum to the consumer. I think spending expectations, retail sales, et cetera, are still reasonably good, decidedly to us, not in recessionary territory, but I think we're getting to this rate of change stuff, and I think these are the conversations that we have to have. Absolute levels of inflation and prices are still high. Rate of change data inevitably is going to slow because of base effects. The question now becomes, do we have enough inertia in the economy to keep the consumer alive so we don't roll into recession? Or does the Fed necessarily, to kill the inflation uh, menace, 
ha have to kind of push us there. There are no good choices here. That's the key. The Fed has no good choices in our opinion, but I think job one is going to be price stability and inflation. And I think inevitably that's going to push us closer to a slowdown or at least a quarter of two of negative, uh, negative growth. Our expectation is companies still earn well, margins still expand a little bit, pricing power is back in a lot of the company areas. And, and again, to Mike's point, there's going to be an interesting uh, juxtaposition against consumption of goods, which was supply chain constrained, and if our mobility data starts to pick up, if experiential consumption services, to Mike's point, starts to pick up, we expected that it would. Again, the the wild card in that is the you know the global and geopolitical events that that, that may get people to retrench. But we still think the consumer's pretty robust in 2022. Kathy Jones on this topic. Final word. Yeah, I, I would I would agree that um, the consumer is still in decent shape, but we we have expected a deceleration in spending, obviously because you have the fiscal stimulus wearing off, and um, and we've exhausted or at least uh, probably exhausted a lot of the demand on the goods side. So services should uh, pick up the slack. I think the telling um, statistic for me recently was the revolving credit number that we got last month. So. We've been seeing pretty good spending and an increase in you know, consumers using their credit cards. And it started to roll over last month. Now, that may be because the fiscal stimulus is wearing off. Um, we also are seeing mortgage rates move up that might slow the housing sector and slow the refis, which is where people cash out to get more money to spend. So we do think in the second half, consumer slows down, but we're not yet in recessionary territory in terms of consumer incomes or spending. Kathy Jones, Mike Wilson, James Camp sticking with us into the opening bow. Coming up in the morning calls and later, traders pricing in seven hikes for 2022 ahead of decision day. More on the Fed's path forward still ahead from New York City with futures up six tenths on the S&P and the Nasdaq bouncing back. This is Bloomberg. Nasdaq 100 at the close yesterday in a bear market. A bounce back this morning on the S&P, the Nasdaq and on the Russell 2. In the equity market, that's the story. In the commodity market, what a move lower from where we were just a week ago on Brent and WTI. Brent right now, just north of 100. WTI with a 96 handle. That's the price action. Here are the morning calls. First up, benchmark upgrading Zoom to a buy, a 124 price target, praising management and the company's potential to realize ambitions. Next up, Goldman downgrading Hormel Foods to a sell, a 44 price target, seeing disruption in food and supply chains from the war in Ukraine. And finally, Jefferies lowering its price target for GM to 44 from 53, noting a stagflationary environment of higher input costs. We're flat there in early trading. Up next, traders turning hawkish as the Fed kicks off its two-day policy meeting, looking for five, six, maybe even seven interest rate hikes this year. I'm not going to do that thing where I give you a nice little neat narrative to explain the price action of the day because in about five minutes it could all change. Futures up seven tenths of 1%, and that's where we are right now on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're positive nine tenths of 1%, a bounce after closing in a bear market yesterday on the Nasdaq 100. There's the opening bow, switch up the board and get to the commodity market. The crude market, which loves to make a fall out of pretty much everybody who tries to forecast it. 95, 94 on WTI, through 130 about a week ago on Brent, sub 100 earlier this morning, approaching 140 a couple of Sundays back. In the bond market, your 10-year yield now coming back down by five basis points on the day to 2.08%. A week ago, trading in the 160s, twos, the 140s last week, and now in and around 180. Euro dollar 109.84, positive on that currency pair, four tenths of 1%, just short of 110. At the opening bow, we advance about eight tenths of 1%. Top of the pile utilities, real estate, information technology at the bottom, as you might expect, given where energy's trading this morning. Crude lower, energy stocks lower by 1.3% with your movers 
Hey, Zappi. John, well, with this bullish start for stocks, let's start out with what is working, and that is most sectors, as you were just talking about. But relative to individual movers, technology, very strong. NVIDIA, the chip uh, overweight stock, is sharply higher, up 1.4%, as yields are lower. And really just a bounce back. That extends to Tesla. They obviously have the EV part of the uh, company that maybe does not fare as well from a psychological standpoint when oil is down. But the technology side doing just fine, up 2%. Delta Airlines soaring up 9%. This, of course, course, as oil is in, as you were talking about, that translates right to the bottom line with not a lot of hedging there, plus jet fuel in. They're also at a JP Morgan conference, as are some of the other airline executives, talking about the fact that profitability is likely this year. Speaking of JP Morgan, yields are down, but the banks are extending the rally to a second day, John. Abby, thank you. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, the main event, the Federal Reserve, your two-day meeting has already started. Here's Mike McKee with more. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, you just mentioned that commodities are making fools out of anybody who who tries to forecast it. Imagine the Fed. The entire economy depends on you. You've got to forecast what's going to happen with commodities, particularly oil. Now, we know what's going to happen tomorrow. We're going to get a 25 basis point increase in the Fed funds rate. But they also have to update their economic forecasts and the dot plot. They're going to have to raise their forecast for inflation. The question is, how much? Then Jay Powell comes out and explains it all. Does he sound hawkish or not? Now, here's the big move of the day tomorrow, and that's the uh, dot plot. You can see there the blue line is where the market thought rates would be on December 15th, the last time they put out the dot plot and the forecast. The line on the top, the white line there, is where the market thinks now those interest rates should be. How close does the Fed come to the market's belief? That's going to have a major impact on how people trade after 2 p.m. tomorrow. And there are a lot of questions for the Fed going forward. Risks, Russia war, obviously, and we don't know what's happening with oil because of that. COVID, signs it's coming back. And maybe there's some other surprise out there. Inflation, uh, base effects coming into uh, play here coming up in the next couple of months should push inflation down. If oil continues to fall, that should push inflation down. We'll have to watch that. And then, of course, the balance sheet reduction. Uh, when and how do they start cutting back on the balance sheet? A lot of questions for the Fed and a lot of things that are very hard to answer at this point. They've got to deliver the forecast, Mike, whether they like it or not. Looking forward to your coverage tomorrow. Mike McKee there. The S&P 500 up 1% three minutes into the session. The Nasdaq Composite up a little more than 1% as well. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research shot me a quick message just yesterday and said, remember the exchange with Chairman Powell and the Republican Senator Richard Shelby at a hearing just a number of weeks ago. Don't forget that. And let's take a listen again. Is the leadership at the Fed under you and the Fed prepared to do what it takes to get inflation under control uh, and protect price stability? I hope history will re record that the answer to your question is yes. Kathy Jones, does Chairman Volcker turn up tomorrow? Well, I think um, that is probably what's planned for tomorrow. But again, Paul has to really thread this needle. So he has to talk about how they're going to be tough on inflation. They're willing to do whatever it takes. And, and that certainly that exchange stood out to me as well. On the other hand, you already have credit spread starting to widen. You've, now we've got commodity prices having reversed. You've got the, um, the Ukraine war, which hadn't been anticipated. And you've got a very flat yield curve. So here we are, the, the two tens is down to under 30 basis points. That spread is very low. So how much can the Fed deliver in terms of, oh, we're willing to uh, fight inflation with a bunch of rate hikes without just inverting the curve? So I, I think they're in a very tricky position. I'm hoping to hear something more on the balance sheet, although I think they'll probably punt that to uh, the next meeting or the meeting after that. James Kemp, your expectations. A tricky position to be sure of their own making, I would suggest. I, I think the key is going to be what the long end does in terms of reaction function. We have a war in Ukraine right now, and we only got down to 160 in the flight to quality trade, and we've, we've already reversed that. I think the marginal buyer, the price indiscriminate buyer of treasuries, the Federal Reserve, exiting the market, I think the fact that we have essentially told 
uh, Russia that their reserves are worthless is going to put some pressure on not only the dollar, but on the, the, the buyer of treasuries. And I think the Federal Reserve has to raise rates, one, to protect the, the dollar as, as reserve currency, and the second is to really be serious about, about the inflation uh, outlook. So to me, the Fed has no good choices, again, of its own making. This is a political conversation. Make no mistake, Senator Shelby, President Biden, this is a, the, the Democrats in the White House have approval ratings that are struggling mightily because of this regressive tax. And so I think the long end goes higher. I think inflation uh, pushes the long end higher. I think the marginal buyer is exiting. And I think the yield curve can, can steepen from here. And Kathy's quite right. It's too flat to, to tighten four or five times. But I don't think the current configuration stays. I think Treasuries move higher from here. Hey, James, if you think 10-year and 30-year yields go higher, aren't you essentially saying this Fed can engineer a soft landing? And how narrow is that runway? I'm trying to understand the range of probabilities around these outcomes. If your base case is higher yields, doesn't that mean you believe the Fed executes that soft landing? Well, no, I think the Federal Reserve tightens credit conditions that are already, as, as noted, tightening. Spreads are widening. I think we get credit conditions into the tightening area, and that, and that orchestrates a slowdown. I do think as rates push higher, at least technically, over the near term, that is going to be a very good buying opportunity for income investors uh, probably the best that they've had in a number of years. If we get to a two and a quarter, two and a half, and the back end of 2022 does look like a slowdown to us, perhaps not recession. But again, this is a tactical trade. We're, we're seeing pressure on the long end. We're going to continue to see pressure on the long end. That does not mean we, we, we simply think we'll stay there and continue to go higher. Uh, inflation is higher than 2%. In any scenario, it's going to be higher than 2%. So yeah. I, I just think that this is going to be a story of rising yields for the first half of the year, Fed front-loading the moves because of the, the political season and the inflation data not getting better in large measure because of the, at the margin, the, the Ukraine incursion. Mike Wilson, you're not waiting half a year. You're already there. In this note, we think long-dated bonds could offer a decent hedge for equity portfolios, which are now more at risk due to a growth slowdown. Why is that, Mike? Well, I mean, it's for the reasons you uh, kind of set up this question, which is I totally agree with your, you know, talking about uh, Senator Shelby's, uh, you know, uh, questioning of Chair Powell and his re response to that. I think it's quite clear that this uh, chair is going to go the distance, okay, meaning they're going to fight inflation, and that's going to require, um, you know, probably breaking the back on growth. So whether that's a recession or not, I really don't care. But I do think that particularly the back end, 20-year and 30-year tenor, now is starting to look relatively attractive if you're running a portfolio of stocks and bonds. And here's why. Our concern now is growth, okay? Our concern is not about the Fed. The Fed is overpriced at this point. It's, it, 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 just like it was underpriced six months ago. Now it's like a race to see who can have the most rate hikes in. It's kind of, it's kind of comical in that regard. But, you know, so we're priced, okay? We're priced for eight hikes over the next year. If they get that done, congratulations. And I agree with the statement I wrote this week, the same thing, but if they get eight hikes done, and back end rates move out, that means they were successful in engineering the soft landing. Um, I don't think it's going to be that smooth. It doesn't mean recession. <clears throat> it just means that growth expectations are going to come down. And so if you're worried about growth like I am, then the back end of the yield curve is offering you very cheap protection, like it usually does historically. Okay. Because remember, in this sell off of stocks, and by the way, we've been in a bear market for stocks now for four months, not a week. And that's been happening as rates have gone up, meaning. Bonds have not provided the shelter they typically provide, which means now they're actually probably a pretty good buy for that protection against a further growth slowdown. If you're not worried about growth, then you shouldn't be buying uh, treasuries at the back end, okay? You should be buying stocks. But that's not our view. Our view is that we think growth is going to disappoint. Mike, lift the lid on the index then. We've done a ton of work to punish tech names, big tech names. On the S&P, I believe year-end you're at 4,400. Let's get away from the index stuff just for a moment. Go into it sector by sector. And on the consumer, which I have to say, your outlier call as I go through your, re your research with the team, has to be this consumer weakness. Where are you looking in the equity market that hasn't been punished that you think needs to be punished? Yeah, well, we do still think that there's more risk on the downside for the consumer, particularly on the good side, but maybe even services too, we'll see, but definitely on the good side. We think technology is still overvalued in many pockets. Uh, but more importantly, John, we think that technology is inherently cyclical. Okay, this is the thing that I think a lot of investors don't agree with us on, which is that technology is, has a secular 
bull, uh, sort of bullish trend to it, but it's still inherently cyclical around that. And of course, pandemic did not allow that cyclical reset because there was a pull forward in demand. So I think there's a chance we have actually a, a recession, a mild recession in technology spending this year as a payback in demand. That needs to get priced. And that has not been priced yet. Industrial is also another area where you're seeing incredible supply chain challenges. And of course, now with this um, invasion, it's gonna make those worse. So those would be three areas, I think, where there's still probably significant downside, um, you know, if the growth, you know, is kind of scare narrative plays out. If that doesn't play out and we're wrong about that, well then, you know, you have to worry about it. So Mike, you put out a range of forecasts. Most banks do. There's a bear case, there's a base case, there's a bull case. Can you walk me through where you're leaning towards? What kind of scenario? You've gone through that, you've painted a picture. Now give me the numbers at the index level. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we've written about this and we are more skewed towards the bear case and we were already the most bearish in our base case. Our base case was 4,400, bear case was 3,900. Remember, that's a year-end target, okay? So we always expected to overshoot on the downside relative to our base. We were talking about 4,000, you know, John, back in January, that's probably a, a place we would go to and then we would have upside to the 4,400. But now 4,000 doesn't look that attractive if the year end you know, price target is 39. We haven't officially moved to that yet, but we're leaning in that direction. So I would say where we would get interested now at the index level, okay, would be somewhere between 35 and 3,800 to give us the appropriate amount of upside um, given the risk that we're still assuming. Mike Wilson, a clinic on the equity market, on the bond market, Kathy Jones and James Camp to the three of you. Thank you very much. A day away from a Federal Reserve decision. Coming up, the US seeking to prevent China from coming to Russia's aid. We have communicated very clearly to Beijing uh, that we won't stand by uh, if um, uh, we will not allow any country uh, to compensate Russia uh, for its losses. The Chinese government has some problems abroad and at home. We'll talk lockdowns next. The National Security Advisor uh, and our delegation uh, raised directly and very clearly our concerns about the PRC's support to Russia in the wake of the invasion uh, and the implications that uh, any such support uh, would have for the PRC's relationship not only with us, uh, but for its relationships uh, around the world. Chinese assets, risk markets, equity markets are getting absolutely hammered at the moment and there are three reasons for it. One's that, the relationship between Russia and China. The other is the regulatory hangover from last year and now we're talking about lockdowns too. The team at China Renaissance Security is saying the following. The sell-off is overdone, but so is everything else. The market is crazy. There's no fundamentals anymore. This is what it sounds like, Damien Sasse, when you're on the wrong side of the trade. <laughs> this might be worse than the 2008 financial crisis. I should not joke, but you know where I'm going with this. Damien, what's going on? Yeah, you know, I mean, Jonathan, these moves in China, I mean, you almost have to look at it and think that the impact, the market impact, is actually worse than that of the crisis in Ukraine, right? I mean, look, let's just be clear. Tencent, Alibaba, and Maituan, three of the largest constituents within the Golden Dragon ADR index, within the Hong Kong uh, China index, all are down roughly 75%. I'm talking in dollar terms. I'm talking in market cap. 75% of the market cap destroyed since February of 2021, Jonathan. It's quite unprecedented, even in China standards. I wanted to talk about lockdowns with you, and then this headline just dropped from Dow Jones, the Wall Street Journal. Saudi is weighing using the yuan instead of the dollar for China oil sales. And take a look at what happened to dollar CNH intraday. Just look at this rollover following this headline. Yeah. Damien, walk me through what you think as I read that out. The Saudis are weighing using the yuan instead of using the dollar for China crude sales. That from Dow Jones. That's amazing. I mean, look, you know, the reality is this dollar yuan, and I was going to talk about it going in the other direction because for the past three days, I mean, we've lost, well, I mean, roughly 1.1% in dollar yuan for a currency cross that's supposed to be managed by the PBOC ultra stable for it to go down 1.1% in that short a period of time is nothing short of spectacular. It's now down 
40 bips on the year. Jonathan, as we know, the yuan, and many people have been talking about the China yuan as being the safe haven currency amidst the crisis, and it sure looked like it. But now with these equity market losses, I mean, all bets are off. And now, you're right, a little bit of support here on the back of the Saudi news. Yeah. But even that is kind of difficult to believe in the current environment. You know, my base case is the fact that China's going to want to toe the middle of the line here. They're going to want to do everything they can not to disrupt the relationship with Russia and the U.S. It's interesting to see how this will be perceived in Beijing. Yeah, Damien, stay there. Let's sit on this breaking news. We've got the perfect guest with us from London, Bloomberg's Javier Blas. Javier, we were going to talk about something different again, but let's just go right here. What do you make of that headline, Javier? Saudi, according to Dow Jones, weighing using the yuan instead of the dollar for China crude sales. Well, it will be really unprecedented for Saudi Arabia to sell their oil in any in any currency other than, than the U.S. dollar. They have been doing that since the, since the 70s without interruption. So it's quite surprising, but we have seen uh, um, news that um, uh, Saudi Arabia wants uh, the Chinese leadership to pay visit to the country. Uh, Sau Saudi Arabia is also trying to sell another stake in Saudi Aramco. Um, potentially, Chinese buyers could be interested. So it seems like a big pivot of um, uh, the, the Saudi leadership towards China and moving against or away, at least, from the United States. Javier, that divide between this administration and Saudi Arabia, do you think this line, this reporting, the sourcing for it has something to do with this? Are they speaking to China at the moment or are they speaking to the administration, the White House? I think that they are speaking to both. I think that they are certainly speaking to China, and the relationship between Saudi Arabia and China has improved significantly over the last few years. But I also think that they are sending a message to the Biden administration. If, um, if you don't like us, we don't need you. Um, so make your mind. Uh, I, I think that Mohammed bin Salman sent that, that, that same message on the interview with the Atlantic magazine, uh, saying that he didn't care anymore what President Biden thought about himself or, or the kingdom. And so, yeah, this is a message as much to Beijing as it is to the White House. Um, Saudi Arabia is saying we have other friends. Javier, Brent's gone from close to 140 to 99. WTI has gone from around 130 to 95 in a week. Can you explain to me what's going on on the screen this morning? Well, it's difficult to explain when you look at the physical market and you see how tight the physical market is. But two things, two very uh, various factors right now. One is the lockdowns in China that we were discussing, and then the potential good news on our potential nuclear deal between uh, the United States, Russia, and other countries, and, and, and Iran. So that could bring uh, a more uh, extra supply from Iran and also reduce the demand from China. But one thing that we are seeing is as virtually everyone in the oil market is taking a step back and a stop trade. If you look at the open interest, the amount of outstanding contracts is at a six and a half year low. If you look at the bid act as, as a spread has widened and at times is at six, seven cents of a dollar. I mean, this is the world's most liquid oil contracts, WTI and Brent. It should trade on a bid as a spread of one or two cents, no more than that. We are seeing at times this morning the bid as a spread as wide as seven dollars, seven cents. Uh, that is unusual and it really is an indication of the very little liquidity that there is out there in the market. And Damien, that's the commodity market. I wanted to finish on one final question with you as we shift forward to tomorrow in 30 seconds, because you and I will have this conversation tomorrow anyway. Yeah. Those two interest payments on those two Russian bonds, you think they're going to be missed? Well, I mean, look, I mean... <laughs> Yes, I do. I absolutely do. But, you know, we're not going to know about it tomorrow. And we may not even know about it the next day or the day after that. But I do believe that there is a willingness on the part of the U.S. not to accept that payment. And more importantly, Russia is kind of reluctant to make the payment, right? So I don't believe they're going to be... Um, I, look, and even if they don't default tomorrow, heaven forbid they find a way to deliver dollars offshore to creditors. And this all we're seeing with Clearstream and Euroclear and all the piping and the plumbing that goes hand in hand with making those payments, even if they try and make their best effort, I'm still not convinced that it's not going to lead to the fall further down the road. Remember, value at risk shocks occur in both directions and they occur in stages, Jonathan. They begin with price, they then go to vol, and then they go to the real economy. I think the economy is starting to look through the inflationary shock, looking to the growth slowdown at the end of the year, and I think yep. that's where we lie. Damien, fantastic as always, buddy. Gents, thank you. Damien Sasser, Javier Blast on this crude market, China.
and everything else, including Russia tomorrow. Let's get you some sector price action. We can do that with Critty Gupta. Morning, Critty. Yeah, good morning, John. You are seeing a fairly broad rally in the market. Consumer discretionary is your leader. Your one sector in the red is going to be energy, of course, following those energy prices lower you were just discussing with Javier Blas. Let's round out that conversation, though, and talk about what it means for the airline stocks, because that's where you're seeing really a lot of action. Your biggest movers this morning are going to be your airlines. Uh, United, Delta, this, of course, comes off of news that Delta sees its first quarter revenue about 78 percent recovered versus 2019 levels. That's relative to the 72 to 76 percent range uh, that you are seeing earlier. And last of all, remember, a lot of these companies aren't hedged against oil prices. So when you see oil tank, that's good for the airlines. Pretty good to Thank you. Coming up, the market moving events in your trading diary. That's next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-five, let's call it twenty-six minutes into the session. We advanced by six tenths of one percent on the S P on the Nasdaq, bouncing back by three quarters of one percent, closing on the Nasdaq one hundred in a bear market yesterday. The winner of the year, the loser of the session, energy equities. Why? Well, here's the why. Crude, Brent down six percent, WTI down seven from one thirty and back down to ninety-five, just like that. Very quickly. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary at the top of the hour. NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg holding a news conference. European officials meeting to discuss Russia, 10.30 Eastern. Russia's coupon payments on $2 bonds coming to tomorrow. We will hear from the president of Ukraine addressing Congress as well. And a big week for central banks with the Federal Reserve kicking things off. From New York City, this was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.